Okay, welcome everyone to the final session of Messaging for Change with um, Trudy Ryan. Great to have those who can make it back. I understand it's school holidays, so thank you for those who, who can make it. Um, there are sessions being recorded and um, just remember to turn off your video and um, microphone. Um, you'll most of you will be familiar with the um, with Teams now, how you can converse with me. If you can't converse in the conversation bar, feel free to send me an email and I'll be on email today. I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which you are meeting in the Golden Broken, the people of the Yorta Yorta and the Tungurong Nation, as well as the Indigenous people of the lands you are joining from. We welcome back Trudy Ryan for the fourth series in Messaging for Change on Values. And today's session, we will we'll be stopping at 10.30, but there'll be plenty of time during the conversation to ask a question. So if you do want a question, either raise your hand, turn on your video, or write in the message um, bar um, so that we can keep the process going, but also include you. Happy to have any of those options. I just wanted to, to give you an example of something that I was thinking about during the week and it touched a real chord for me. Um, I went for a run on the weekend and as the I will just share my screen because I have this photo that I'd like to show you. Can everybody see that photo of a sun? So I went for a run and um, the sun was coming over the hills and it was super, super frosty on Saturday morning. And um, the sun was shining on a fence line that had spider webs all through it. And I immediately thought about the messages from last week with Trudy about the spider web and how we can create um, values based messaging around those sorts of things and I started to and as I was continuing to run I was trying in my head of all the analogies that I could come up with and all and so it was great you know like land care creates linkages like a spider web and you know the spider webs are usually unseen until the sun or a certain light hits them and that's the same as sometimes I feel like land care workers and you know all of a sudden they do something or something's changed because of their presence. And it was just such a beautiful analogy. I just wanted to share that. So um, without further hesitation, sorry, I was um, overtaking there, but I will pass back to Trudy and um, look forward to what you have to say to us this week, Trudy. Thanks very much, Kirsty, and uh, good morning, everybody. And, and thanks for sharing that um, observation with us, Kirsty, as well. Once you get into that sort of metaphor spotting mode, you see them everywhere and then you start running away with them and, and uh, you know, extending your analogies and, and that opens up new frames of thinking as well and connection. So I hope you've enjoyed, you know, doing a bit of metaphor, metaphor spotting this week, everyone, and, and thinking about how you can incorporate that into your work. So um, thanks again for joining us today. I'll just share my screen. All right, there we go. So here we are, we've finally arrived at session four of our four sessions and today is about bringing it all together. So today we're going to focus on how we can apply the learning from our last few sessions on facts and frames, values, metaphors, imagery, all those elements that we've been learning about and how those elements shape reasoning and how we can apply this knowledge in our messaging. So what we're going to do today is go through a stepped process of how you can build or create a values based message. So we can go through this process of message construction together. So if we were face to face, we'd all be sitting down with bits of paper and going through this, but I've tried to step it out online as best we can. So we're going to go along, create our message as we go, but also um, hop out and go back to some of the things that we've learned, some of the key things to keep in mind, perhaps some, you know, as we create our message, just to jog your memory. 
Um, so as Kirsty said, if you've got any comments or questions throughout, just um, pop it in the chat box or put your hand up, or if that doesn't work, pop your microphone on them and um, we'll see how we go. All right. So to recap from week one, what is values-based messaging? We know a lot more about it now and how it can help you as a Landcare facilitator or coordinator when you're communicating with people and trying to activate positive change. So values-based messaging is messages that change hearts, minds and behaviours. And we're going to go into this this morning as we develop our message. So as we've discussed, it's an evidence-based approach. It's based on research from many different disciplines, things like behavioural sciences, evolutionary psychology, sociology, cognition, linguistics, marketing. It's a big mismatch of evidence from a whole range of fields. But fundamentally, it's about how people think and reason and, and come to judgments on issues. So we're applying the science of communication to communication. And that's so important. So as we've discussed in land care and throughout the social and environmental sector, our communication resources are always really limited. And we know that people's attention spans are, are stretched and limited as well. So we can't afford to do communication just for communication's sake. We've got to be strategic. And that strategy starts with this, this understanding of how people reason and how we can apply our messaging for the best end. So how we will move people and drive change. So we need to make the most of our opportunities to connect with our audiences. To this end, we engage people on shared values. And in fact, we lead our messages with shared values as we'll talk about today those shared intrinsic values. So values-based messages, they're the messages that you want to tell. You know, they're about hope and optimism. They're not about fear and dread. And they're the messages that your audience wants to spread. So we, we, we message to, we keep in mind our supporters and our base, and they're the messages that they'll get excited about and they'll tell their more persuadable or fence-sitting neighbours, family, colleagues. So we stick to the truth. Um, this is about presenting evidence, data, statistics within a values-based frame that means something to our audience and so drives that positive change. So setting a message purpose. This is when you write, you might think, right, I've got to sit down, I've got to write this article for the Landcare magazine or to send out in my newsletter. This is what you might the process that's really a good way to think about how you can construct a message that changes hearts, minds and behaviours. So as I said, values based messaging, we're looking to change hearts, minds and behaviours in that order. Um, and there's a reasons we say it's, you know, it's a, it's a saying, it's an old saying. We talk about hearts and minds. There's a reason we don't say minds and hearts. Um, you have to feel it first. You have to believe it before you see it. So when we're setting our message purpose, have that progression in mind. So we're wanting to change hearts, then minds, then behaviours. So a good way to think about this, think about what you want your audience to feel, which is about hearts, to know, which is about minds, and to do, which is about behaviour. So keep in mind, feel no do. What do I want them to feel? What do I want them to know? What do I want to do them to do? So if I was going to write, say, an article about the need to protect scattered paddock trees for wildlife, and I was the audience as farmers in my district, what do I want them to feel? So you can just sort of brainstorm a little bit for yourself. Think, what do I want them to feel? And it might be a sense of environmental stewardship. Um, you know, I love nature, responsibility to, to other species, future generations, that kind of thing. So you might just jot down and brainstorm or talk in your group about what do we want people to feel? You know, what's the what's the connection here in this message? What do we want them to know? What's the information we're trying to get across? Scattered trees are critical, um, habitat for wildlife, they're disappearing and there's no de regeneration without protection. So that's the more analytical. So we're mixing an emotional and an analytical information in our messages. And what do we want them to do with this information? So let's, you know, fence off some scattered trees on their farm and protect that re regeneration. 
So we, we have a bit of a message structure. And so you can see that really contemplating that feel no do is a really essential step in developing messages that change hearts, minds and behaviours. All right, and so then how do we move on from feel no do, which just gets you in the headspace for constructing your message, really tuning in on what it is that you want to say. We then lead into a really uh, a message structure for a values based message, and it's quite important. It's very simple. This is not a complex process at all, but it's important to keep in mind the order in which we structure our message. So what we do is start with shared values. And we've talked a lot about our shared intrinsic values. And we know that from research that the intrinsic values around benevolence, universalism and self-direction, they're the values that most people say that they use as their guiding motivators in life. They're the values that people are drawn to. So when we're talking about shared values, we start our messages, we're emphasising commonalities and not differences. And then we're emphasising broad points of agreement. Remember, these are widely shared values around, you know, doing the right thing by communities and um, fairness, honesty, help, um, social justice. These are broad points of agreement in society. So we're starting our message with shared values. Then we lead into the problem. So we never start our messages with problems. Um, as we've talked about, it just switches people off. But if we start our message with shared value, then we lead into problems. What we're doing then is, is creating a bit of disease in, in the mind. We're creating dissonance. It's like the shared value that we've all agreed to, that we're all nodding along that, yeah, that's the shared value that we're, you know, we're trying to aspire to. The problem spells out a threat to that shared value and creates a sense of, you know, uncomfortableness and and also just a willingness to listen to what's the next thing what's the next thing and of course the next thing is the solutions so the solutions provide hope relief for that dissonance that you're feeling and get us into a more motivational space because we're offering solutions to the problem that threaten that shared value so you can see we're taking people on a bit of a reasoning journey you know a bit of an emotional journey as well then we finish our messages with a call to action. So giving people a really clear call to action is important and we'll break that down a little bit more this morning. But it's giving people agency and purpose and so they can see themselves as, as collective actors in the solution. So it's, they can, it's good with your call to action to show how their individual efforts are linking up and crossing scales as we've talked about the importance of connecting and crossing scales. So this is a message construction that works it's you know it's evidence based it's tested so i really encourage you to, to just give this a go in your work to set up yourself a little template like this and we'll work through one this morning and see how you go to create these messages that are changing hearts minds and behaviors so we're just focusing you can use that little the boxes on the left you can see the shared values is in dark blue and the others are um, less uh, apparent um, use that as your orientation as we move through the session. So just to review some of those key things that we have to keep in mind about values as we're constructing the shared values component of our message. So we've learned that people can be motivated by a whole range of values, all the values that you see in those 10 segments in different contexts. But we know from experimentation and evidence that values even engaged temporarily will orientate reasoning. So if we include those words, around those self-direction, universalism, benevolence segments, there are intrinsic values. If we include values, you know, if we, we talk about a sense of social justice, we talk about care for nature, we talk about creativity, curiosity, <clears throat> that's engaging people into a mindset, into a frame of reasoning through which to receive the facts that we'll, we'll tell them, the evidence that we'll tell them. So <clears throat> we know also that values have a ripple effect and a seesaw effect. We talked about that, <clears throat> excuse me, in week two. So if we're talking about values around universalism and doing the right thing, we know that they'll spill out into nearby values and so strengthen that message. 
And we know also not to try and, you know, cover all our bases and have values here and there around that values chart. And remember, we talked about messages that had those very mixed value signs. And that, it, you know, it's like you're driving down a, a country road and you've got signs going everywhere and you just don't know, you know which way to go. You need clear direction. So think about our values as signposting clear direction through for reasoning. So we don't we don't mix universalism and achievement primes in our messages. So we know too that values are like muscles. And the more that we activate those values, the stronger they get, because this is those neural pathways in our head get stronger with repetition and just become our way of reasoning. So we want to keep building those, you know, community care, compassion, pro-environmental mindsets in our audiences through our messaging. And fundamentally, we want to just keep in mind, we want to engage those intrinsic values. They're the greater good pro-environment mindsets um, to get people into. And as I just said, we want to avoid those extrinsic values, which are around power and wealth and status and money, because they shrink people's mindsets and get them into actually demonstrated from research, they'll be less likely to volunteer, less likely to donate if we prime those values. So we stay with the intrinsic values. We talked also in week two about the deeper motivations. So intrinsic values are, are up in this space here. You can see my mouse doing that. Um, where we're in that growth gain expansion mindset. You know, it's anxiety free because these things aren't limited you can't have enough creativity or curiosity or kindness, um, you know. Whereas down in the bottom part of our values wheel, these extrinsic values, they're activating those deeper motivations of resource protection. We talked about that sort of shrinking your thinking, you know, loss and scarcity mindset. So creativity is reduced, options space thinking is reduced. So we wanna keep our messages up in that possibility space in the top. Just before we move off into problems, I keep stressing this about remembering about the, the perception gap. So, you know, most people, and in fact, people in 88 or 89 countries where these assessments have been done, say that they attach the most important to intrinsic values. So really keep that in mind. People care, and we need to create our messages in that knowledge that people care. So, you know, if in doubt about, you know, we all have our own bias because it comes out in the research that people think, well, these values are important to me, but, you know, Joe Bloggs down the street doesn't think that. We know from research it's a really common human bias to, you know, we're, we're sort of underestimating each other's capacity to care, but don't let that constrain your messaging really start in the knowledge that, that people care. So remember we said that people prioritise, this is generally, people prioritise benevolence, self-direction and universalism values. This is what they tell us in research. And people say that the values of, of tradition, stimulation and power are of least importance to them. But when asked, what do most people prioritise? People say power. When clearly that's not the case. So people are telling us that self-direction, universalism, and benevolence are the most important values to them, but they have a perception and it's a bias and it's wrong according to the research that people prioritise power. So don't let that constrain your message. That we need to start trusting that science that, that people do care. So how do we use this? So we've talked about our values. We want to go back to our message about trying to encourage farmers to protect scattered trees through fencing on their farms. So we just jot down some values that might help us construct a message. So here I've, I've popped down responsibility, protecting the environment, unity with nature, the idea of justice, doing the right thing, being helpful, you know, a bit of meaning in life, doing something beyond your own personal benefit. Um, creativity, curiosity, what species might come and visit those trees. You might have think of, of some other values there that you could add into that. And just think of this as a bit of a, you know, you're just sort of doing a bit of a brainstorm. All of these values might not end up in your message, 
but they just, you know, you want to keep your keep your thinking open. So you notice they're all in that intrinsic value space. You know, they're all prime and different intrinsic values. Perhaps there's some self-direction, universes and benevolence, but they're all in that intrinsic value space where we're engaging those greater good mindsets. So on to problems. You'll notice in the left bar there that we're down into problems now. So don't start your messages with problems. And we've talked about this a little bit as we've gone along in these sessions, is that this is kind of, because there's advocates, environmental advocates or social advocates, we so desperately want people to hear our point of view that sometimes we get a little bit shouty in our words and in our language, in our attempts to try and convince people about the importance of our issue or, or the problems. But we know we're starting with problems, even if they are expressed as compelling evidence-based facts, it won't be enough on its own to change hearts, minds and behaviours. We need to start with shared values to connect with people and engage first. Um, because if we just start with, with a problem and if we, we talk about that problem in, in fear and, and anger, um, emotions, it might attract a bit of short-term clicktivism or donation, people showing up, but it doesn't sustain a long-term movement. And it's very hard to move people from, you know, feeling angry and feeling fearful into doing something that's based in hope. So um, people need to feel like they're creating something and that's really important. So engaging them with shared, shared values first is a way to, to connect people in and then, then articulate the problem, but don't start with problems. Um, the little cartoon down the bottom is, you know, an approach I know I've probably been very guilty of in the past as well. You know, here's our slogan, everything's dying, there's no hope, give us money. <laughs> uh, you know, it it's just doesn't get you over the line. So keep that in mind. Also with our problems, we need to really describe our problems. Um, we talked about building explanatory chains so really leading people through cause and effect as a lead into our solutions, really explaining, well, you know, this happens and then that happens. And so we need to do this so that they've got this clear understanding. They've got a logic loop to go through. Think about uh, shining a light on the pond, that uh, the, our little metaphor that we've been using in this series. What metaphors could you use to help build that explanation? Remember, you're taking people's experience from, you know, from their, their lived experience and you're applying those associations and those understandings to describe something new. So what stepping stones, what, um, you know, what mental stepping stones or thoughts can you give people, you know, to, where can you shine a light to help their reasoning? So think about your metaphors and Kirsty told us about her, you know, um, engagement with that spider web metaphor as being a bit of a network you know land cares in this we're in this network we're part of this web what metaphors will help you and talking in pictures as well how much you talk in pictures and we talked last week about this is that you might you know instead of using the term biodiversity which might be a bit of a jargon term that we just could roll off the tongue and we're all used to saying things like that describe it in pictures so you know birds insects animals shrubs, grasses, you know, give it life, take it from sort of, you know, off the page so that people can see it in their heads. Um, habitat, we talk about shelter, nesting sites, you know, that sort of thing. So think about how you might talk in pictures as you describe your problem. So back to our, our messaging sort of template here. So the problems, you know, again, we're just jotting them down. We might not get everything. Uh, no regen, no age diversity loss of habitat, um, you know, loss of movement opportunities across the landscape. They'll disappear, there's only this much left and you can start bringing your facts in, you know, if you know there's only the, this percentage left across the landscape because you've got that values-based frame that you've set up to go through. So you're just jotting down again, you might not get everything into your final message, um, but you want to keep your thinking options open. And then we move into solutions. So solutions in the message, they provide relief from the problems that shared, that threaten the shared value. And you want to sort of, um, you know, try and outdo your solutions to your problems. Think about having more solutions so that you're kind of overwhelming the problem with solutions. 
and think about that explanation, that explanatory power closing the logic loop for people. And just go back to those, those frames that we talked about in week one, those powerful and really empowering frames for these, um, for these change messages. We said we try and think about prioritising hope over fear in your messages, that we need to, to provide some inspiration, you know, vision, vision of what we want these, these landscapes to look like and saying what we're for, not what we're against, you know, as we create that vision, we want these healthy functioning landscapes, um, create some good, you know, and of course we need to acknowledge the realities and the urgencies in our, our messages, but we need to have something to work for, not just against. So keep that in mind, um, that sense of creating a sense of optimism, you know, in, in any social environmental change, people have to believe that it's possible to do it. Here now together, we talked about this idea of so psychological distance in, you know, whether it be in space and time and how we need to sort of move things a little bit more into the here and now. And the together is we need to build a we, you know, no one can do these things on their own. We, we need to, to encourage these actions across the landscape so that they have more, more meaning and more resonance and they're more effective. So think about the here now together. How can you, how can you bring that closer to home? You know, um, how can you explain things like, you know, these, these trees take, you know, 150 years or so to, to create a hollow. Just trying to make things more resonant for people, bring it closer and a way to do that is through explanation. Connect and cross scales was our last empowering frame for change, just to keep in mind to help you when you're constructing your message. So no one can do this on their own. Um, no one farmer or one land care group can solve these problems on their own. We need to get this across, cross scales, connect up and show that this is, this is a movement. This is something that we're doing together because that's the only really meaningful way, you know, that we can get to system structural change is, is through this idea of, of collective action. So we want to keep people motivated by showing them how the, what they're doing on their farms, linking up in their landscape and how that's linking up to other landscapes and regionally and so on and so on. So we're, we're getting that sense of momentum and positive trajectory into our messages. So if we jot down some ideas for solutions, um, you notice know, there's just, you know, these are just ideas, you might not put them all in. There's more solutions and problems. Um, we want to try and swamp those problems with solutions. You know, fence old trees, support regen, weed, add in some diversity in shrubs and trees. Um, creating stepping stones, so there's a metaphor in, we get that idea of stepping stones. You know, the landscapes are like oceans, that kind of thing, lily pads in a lake, whatever works for you. Get that sense of efficacy, let's start today. What you do on your farm matters. You know, it's a, it's got a bit of a sense of possibility leading out of the problem space into, well, here's, we're up in this gain space. There's ideas, there's options, there's optimism. So, and when you come to the last part of your message construction, um, it's about, you know, really having a sense of creating, uh, right, what do we do from here? We've got a trajectory, we've got solutions, let's get out there and do it. Um, and it's good to sort of, you know, when you're doing this, call back to those intrinsic values, really have it in your mind. Look, people are telling us that these values are the most important to us and they do care about the environment, they do care about community cohesion, they do care about the greater good. Start with that, think, think the best of people, you know, and then you'll mm -hmm. appeal to their compassionate, greater good values. So start with that in mind and think, you know, it's not, it's maybe it's not that people don't care, maybe they just don't know what to do. And so we can start our messages from that point and think, okay, so I need to really be quite specific in what I'm asking. Sometimes calls to values are, are too broad, you know, change your light bulb, solve climate change, they don't match the size of the problem and the scale of the solution, they don't match and so it doesn't, doesn't stick in our minds. You know, just facts bounce off frames. So trying to be quite specific in what you're asking people to do. 
So again, we're sort of trying to nurture motivation through those intrinsic values. We know from evidence that that's what people care about. So we lead our messages from that assumption and we lead our calls to action from that assumption as well. So calls to actions have to be meaningful and feel meaningful. People have got to understand, and this is where that power of explanation is so important. How is what you're asking me to do going to solve that problem so that we can, you know, realise those shared values? So be meaningful and feel meaningful. So it's got to, it's got to make a connection and that's where the values are so important as well. If we can put sort of a moral or a value purpose or a motivation into our messages, it has more meaning and it's actually more memorable. You know, studies have shown if, you, if you're mixing information uh, and emotion, those memory, they, they form memories that are more uh, enduring and long lasting. So if we can put an emotional or a value purpose into our message, it's more resonant, it's more meaningful, it's more worth doing. We can see how to make things better. So calls to action, they've also got to be possible and within your audience's power. So we have to be realistic about that and give people things that they can actually do. And part of that is also being quite specific um, in the actions that we're asking. So, you know, you might, you might even be so specific as, can we do it in this time period? Can we do this many things? So just, just sort of, you're creating a sense of possibility for people. So we don't want to be, be too bossy, of course, in our messaging, but trying to give people a sense of efficacy and purpose and clear direction. What can I do? It's also important um, that it's participatory. And what I mean by that is that people can put their own stamp on things as well. So, you know, you want to guide people along the path, but if, as I just said, you don't want to be too too bossy, people have got to have that sense of agency and purpose and, um, you know, their autonomy as well. So we're asking them to do something, but they might, you know, they might decide to, you know, fence something else or, you know, like we, we can't be um, too prescriptive, but as much detail and direction as we can give people, the better. So what might this look like in a message? So you can see down the bottom, um, put in an ask. Maybe fence three trees, is that reasonable? You know, um, maybe you could ask your neighbour to do the same, to build that sense of social proof and, and regional collective action. Put a time frame on it, can you do it this winter? Because if we don't say when, you know, you know what it's like, we all put off everything. I know I'm putting off all sorts of things at the moment. Um, time bound, it actually gives you a bit of structure so we're asking people to do something now with an eye on the future. We're linking, we're connecting and crossing scales. We're showing what you do on your, on your farm matters from a landscape point of view. So we try and be clear. So these are like, um, think of these as being like a, a brainstorm sheet. So you could print out a little template like this or just write, you know, shared values, problem solution action in that order on a piece of paper and start brainstorming what your message is. You know, this think of this structure as being like a scaffold for your message. Have a think about um, what messaging, message strengthening tips you could add in there. You know, think about where am I gonna trim some hedges? Remember we talked about taking out those little qualifying words that soften your message, that, you know, distract from the momentum that you're creating in your message. Um, little tricks like I can speak from inevitability, um, you know, changing your ifs to whens. Are you talking pictures? Can you can you drop out some technical terms and bring those terms to life, you know, with more sort of three-dimensional words that people can see? Do that little trick, try and draw it out. Does your message make sense? Think about the metaphors you're using. Do they work? Do they make sense? Often, you know, we can mix our metaphors, which can dilute the strength of our message. But if you can get a really beautiful run through of, of metaphors, then you know how powerful it is. It really takes you somewhere. So, and all importantly, are we engaging the right values? And is, our, is that consistent and coherent through our message? So you don't have to tick all the boxes on all those things, but the more things you do, the, the stronger your message will be. So just 
you know, jot down some points and then you can sort of fancy it up a little bit and turn them into some, you know, nicer sounding sentences. So don't try to read off the screen. I've got it nicer on the next um, slide. But just to show you how this scaffolding, you know, how you can kind of sequence this approach. So you've got your dot points. You can start putting those into sentences and then you can drop that scaffolding away. And what you're left with is a good values-based message. So this might be an article for a land care magazine, a newspaper article, a social media post. So I'll just read through and as I read through, think about how you feel, you know, think about what's going here, what's going on here as well. There's an emotional, there's an analytical, there's, there's information. How you feel about you going from sequence from shared values into problems, the problems threaten your shared values, the solution gives you a way out and the call to action gives you efficacy and right, right a sense of momentum. So think about that and some of the strategies as I read through. We all love our old paddock trees. These magnificent old trees with their spreading limbs and seasons of flowering and growth give our farms character. So we're very place based. Um, so many animals use these trees for food, nesting and shelter. So that's that talking in pictures there. When we care for these trees, we also care for the insects, birds and other animals that call these trees home. So it's a sense of that greater good. These trees are just more than just trees. They're doing a, a whole range of things. Imagine your farm without these trees and the thousands of birds, animals and insects that depend on them. These trees are old and nearing the end of their life. Without regeneration of younger trees to take their place, your farm could look, feel and sound very different to today. So the problem is, you can see how the shared value is under threat by the problem and um, bringing in some prompts about more sensory, you know, input, look, feel and sound to just to sort of give you that, get across that picture, you know, in, in uh, other sensorial ways is a good strategy because it's actually, you know, it, it's more than just facts. You know, we're getting to the heart of it. So into the solutions. Fencing around older paddock trees gives younger trees a chance to grow. If you plant other trees and shrubs within the fenced area, you'll be helping even more wildlife find a home. Leaving fallen logs and branches adds to the habitat mix. These little patches are important. They provide stepping stones so that other animals can move from patch to patch and they link your farm to the bush. So you're putting in some explanatory change, you're going with your problems to your solutions, you've got that cause effect solution approach. So the satisfying messages because they, they close that log logic loop in your mind. We've added in, uh, got a metaphor or two in there. Um, and there's, you know, things that you can do, but there's a few little strategies there that will help. So finishing off on a strong call to action, paying trees need your help. Now, you know, you could put in, put in now or now or today. Will you fence off three old trees on your farm this winter? So just asking, people might say, oh, I'll, I'll put in, I'll fence off 10. But, you know, you're just sort of asking a question. And it politely. But, and ask your neighbour to do the same. Let's look after our old paddock trees, keep the new growth safe and make sure there'll always be trees, birds and other animals on our farm. So you're finishing on a motivational up. You've got a sense of this is a problem, but we can do something about it. And the call to action is quite specific because you could, you know, you can see yourself actually, yeah, contemplating that. I could, I could fence off three old trees. So that's what a values-based message is. That's that progression from shared values, problems, solutions, actions. And you can apply that in all sorts of settings for all sorts of issues and in all sorts of contexts. You can you can um, you could shorten that, you could extend it out. And it's you know, as I said, it's it's proven it, it works cognitively in terms of how people reason and understand about issues. And I encourage you to sort of give it a go, give it a try in your messaging. Um, also, it's important with the images. We've talked about the images that they should really back up what you're saying. So in this case, you know, we're talking about um, habitat, we're talking about what we're to do with the fence, what it might look like, how it looks at that landscape scale. So really linking what you're doing on your place 
to how that might improve landscape health and then you know talk about you know if you're over in eastern victoria and western victoria the land group land care group did this and they found that all these different birds came back to you know or whatever it is so you're linking elsewhere so we're building a movement and building that sort of social norm that this is what people are doing everywhere and that's what sort of starts building a movement so we're normalizing that truism that people do care and do want to make these positive changes before you hit send on your social media post or you know send off your email with your article um oh sorry there's those points there um check in does your message pass that feel no do test so just go back then to your message and go keep that hearts minds and behaviors progression in mind Am I passing the feel no do test? Did it do, do what I wanted it to do? Is that what people reading this would feel? Is that what they would know? And is that what they would do? So just give yourself a bit of a, a check in point. Feel no do. Are you feeling it? Are you understanding it? Do, do you feel equipped to do something about it? Um, none of us have got any money to do message testing, unfortunately, but there are things that you can do with absolutely zero budget. So find out what motivates your audience. We make a lot of assumptions about what motivates our audience and we know from the perception gap and, you know, I think there's, there's just hundreds of identified human biases. You know, we might get that wrong. So it's, it's instead of assuming farmers are motivated by this or that, we, we can ask people. It's really important to ask, um, not in a creepy way, don't go up to someone and say, what do you feel no do? But like asking, you're trying to sort of, to in conversation, just gently find that out. How do you feel about this? You know, try to, try to get a sense of what their understanding is. That, you know, if you can do surveys and stuff, that's great. But if you can't, you know, you might just be just doing these more informal, trying to sort of extract that kind of information from conversation. But do try and find out. Don't just assume, because we might be wrong. And compare different messages, even if you can, you know, you can comparing different value primes. How do they work? You know, even if you've got, uh, ask, you know, a colleague or, you know, a family member, what do you think about these two different messages? Is it, you know, trying to get to that sense of feel no do. So before you take it out into the world, just, you know, just test it, give it the feel no do test. Um, do some desk research as well about values and what people, um, what motivates people to act. Remember we said earlier, I'm, I'm, I think it's the National Land Care Survey about the benefits of being involved in land care. Um, I'm not sure where they're at with the, the um, crunching together of that data, but that will be a really valuable source because I'm sure it will reveal a lot of the values that motivate people to get involved. And then you can reflect that back to, pe back to people in your messages and in the stories that you're writing or the, the talks that you're giving. So last words, um, as we finish off this series, keep in mind those intrinsic values, they are the dominant values in society. I mean, these are the ones we want to prime. So they activate those greater good attitudes and behaviours, the beyond the self, bigger than self, pro-environmental, pro-community values. So they're the dominant values. Evidence tells us that. So we need to start our communications with that knowledge in mind. People care. We know that reasoning occurs through values, frames, metaphors and imagery, not facts and data alone. Facts and data are important elements of course and we always stick to the truth in this type of messaging but we just don't lead our messages with facts and data we know on their own they're not going to be enough to change hearts minds and values uh, hearts minds and behaviors we need to start with a values-based frame so think about those values-based frames that we want to prime those intrinsic values to give people a, a reasoning, sort of a signpost, an orientation for how they're going to interpret the information that you're giving. And we want to lead with shared values, not problems. Just keep that in mind. Don't hit people with the problems first. Engage those shared values. Get people into those receptive mindsets. We know even engaging people 
in mindsets temporarily through some of the words that we use, some of the sentiments, sentence openers. Gee, these trees are beautiful, aren't they? You know, just statements like that can actually just get people into a different reasoning mindset. And finally, how we message is how we go forward. So why not go forward with the intrinsic values that activate hope, kindness, compassion, justice and stewardship. So I hope you found this approach to messaging interesting and useful and that um, you'll think about applying it in your work. So thanks very much for your attention. Thank you. Thanks, Trudy. That was great. Um, I remember hearing some of this um, from Trudy oh, a couple of years ago at the Beechworth Living Festival or Sustain, whatever it was. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I, I was so excited, I took it back to the network chairs <laughs> of the whole region and I said, right, this is the way we've got a message going forward. Um, but um, I think I didn't have the background quite right. So, it, you know, and I was passionate, but not necessarily means that everybody else is passionate. So it's just lovely to rehear it and um, see, see how it will progress with an audience who's really um, ready to, to give this a go. So thanks. Now I've got a question from Cassie for Trudy. Does she use the benefits barriers approach when thinking through messages too, perhaps as a background before crafting the message? Um, benefits barriers, so that would sort of be solutions problems. Do you, is that? Um, Cassie, can you come online? Hi. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Oh, good. Hi, Trudy. Hi. Um, yeah, I was thinking, is the um, community-based social marketing Doug Mackenzie Moore's stuff? So oh. he, um, he get, looks through um, what are the benefits of people of a particular practice and what are the barriers to them of doing that practice? Yeah. And so he, he's got his approach based on that stuff. Okay, yeah, that's that's great. And there's there's so many, there's a world of, you know, approaches and, um, you know, ways that you can look at your messaging and it's good to sort of get around and Google around and, you know, there's some really good stuff and you can, you can pick, you know, what will work for you and blend these different things. And certainly this, this approach that I'm talking about is a fusion of a whole range of different stuff and lots of my own experience starting out as an interps ranger as a 20 something year old, um, you know, long history in environmental communication. So yeah, um, those strategies are good. I would, whatever you're doing, I would really encourage you to start with shared values. Um, presenting problems as barriers is really effective as, as you've just mentioned too, Cassie, because it's barriers, think about the metaphor, the metaphor that, you know, we associate with barriers. Barriers are things that we can go around, we can go under, we can go over, we can dismantle. So, you know, thinking of problems as barriers is a good way to present them because it means that they, you know, we've got some human agency, we can change those those things. So thanks, Cassie. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I have a question, Trudy, about, um, I was just thinking when you were saying values-based messaging, then the problems, is there a risk of falling into those opposing values when you start talking about the problem? Um, I guess it depends on the way that you express them, but that's why doing a message review is actually really valuable and to go, Hang on a minute. What what was I intending to do? What was my feel no do? My you know my purpose. You always want to engage those shared values. It, you know, as I've said other times, if you were selling trying to sell a luxury car or, or an expensive handbag, you would be priming a completely different set of values. Yeah. Um, you know, if you were trying to make a population fearful, you would you know look at Donald Trump. You would you would be priming those values around authority and you know security. But for us, we're wanting to encourage positive social and environmental change. We want to be up in that intrinsic sector. So yeah, we're priming the shared values that we all agree to, you know, we all roughly agree to and aspire to. They're widely held values, the data shows us that. Um, and the problems are presented as a, as a or barriers or problems, whichever language you'd like to use. They threat, you know, they're a threat to the realization of those shared values. So, yeah, I hope that answers your question, does it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just, I suppose, 
you know, whether we see things, but, you know, is there that tendency to go, um, yeah, I think it just takes practice probably in, in this way of writing. Yeah, and draw it out. And, and as I said in that second week, you know, print off that, that values map, the, the, the wheel, the circle, and if you do just little ticks like we did on those, the you know, the land care spot the the values yep. spot just give yourself a little tick and hang on a minute, I've, I'm priming too many different values here. I need to get going in this direction. Um, yeah. You know, just as another little check on your message. Oh, yeah. It's yeah. Too. And it's amazing when you're writing something and you can just do a little tweak. Sometimes it'll just go clunk into place and you think, oh, that, yeah, that feels better, you know, and yeah, it okay. feels better. It's not, it sounds better. You know, both of them together. Yeah. Um, creating a good message that will create change. Yeah, that's great. So I've got a couple of comments from people in the messaging box. Great info, thank you from Karen O'Keefe. And Kathleen Brax says, so, so, so brilliant, thank you. <laughs> and Andrea says, thank you, the information you've shared has helped me understand how to use the messaging better. Um, and guys, please, please fill out the survey. I have posted it in the messing message box and I have sent it to you um, in an email this morning. So we'd really welcome feedback and how we can move forward in this space. Um, so that would be fantastic too. Anybody with any other questions for Trudy before she heads off in a few minutes? So many great tips to incorporate. I should I should finish too and just you know really thanking you all again for the work that you do such an important role you know I'm yeah such an admirer of, of what you do and this you know bringing together a people and place and and nature you know it couldn't be more important so thank you for the work that you all do so if we've got no more messy um questions um I think just a huge thank you to Trudy um as I said in the very first one, I hope I did, this was going to be a workshop for three CMA CNFs um, staff. And when I approached Trudy about doing a webinar, she goes, oh, oh I'm not sure, I'll, I'll give it a go. And um, it's, it's happened. And I, I feel really privileged to be a part of the process and part of the um, webinar series. And I'm just so grateful we've been able to share it from a Victoria wide perspective. So um, yeah, so thank you very much, Trudy, for accommodating us and COVID. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. We've got a message from Cassie again. Does Trudy run sessions for land care groups themselves? And that would be yes, but there's a yep. fee associated with the, the the presentations. Yeah, sure. So yeah, I sort of work across um, social environmental um, messaging. So yeah, always happy to help. Thanks. Yeah. And we've got lots of thanks and um, lots of good reinforcement of message today. Um, yeah, no worries. Thanks to me for organising. That's all good. Great to have this training, thanks. Would we be able to have more sessions run statewide? Look, and I think Cassie, that comes back to potentially a community of practice that we can all get involved in and share ideas and, and um, help each other out. And um, this is recorded, so um, this will be available for people on the GBCMA website. So you can actually ask me or, or look on the website or, um, yeah, any of those things. So um, that should help as well get the message out there. Thank you, everyone. And uh, we'll, we'll call it quits because Trudy's husband is running a webinar at 10.30. <laughs> um, so she's got to quickly change seats. <laughs> Right, that's right. <laughs> but lots, don't forget the survey, everyone, and thanks again. Look forward to seeing you in person at some stage. Right. Thank Take you. Take care. Bye.